All right, chapter 12.7, which is theoretical and experimental probability. In all honesty, they're both about the same. It's just a very small, subtle difference between the two, and I'll try to explain it maybe later on. I don't know. We'll see if that comes up. I'm doing a cold run on these notes, so let's see if I can make it. You should have some basic experience with probability at this point in your math careers, and the formula for probability P of an event E is just number of successes over total. You should probably write that down because that's going to get used a lot. But it has to be memorized because probability pops up a lot of different times in ACTs, SATs, random questions, probably the map somewhere. And once you understand, it's really not that bad if you can just break it down to that piece of information. Uh, this is an easy process to understand, but again, you must execute it properly. Count the number of outcomes that are good, which is your successes, divided by the number of total outcomes, which is, again, the total, and that gives you your number. So what is the difference between theoretical and experimental probability? It looks like I did my job when I made this a year ago. Uh, theoretical probability is it's something that should happen. So there's a 50% chance that you flip heads on a coin. Theoretically, if you flip a coin 100 times, you should have 50 heads and 50 tails. All right. So theoretically, you should end up with, you know, one thing or another. You should end up with 50 heads and 50 tails. How many of you have ever flipped a coin 10 times? You rarely end up with five and five. So when you actually do the experiment, that is called experimental probability. So Theoretically, we use 50% chance. Experimental probability just means you actually did an experiment and you're using the experiment's results to run your results. So experimental probability is a probability that actually happens. So again, theoretical probability, you don't need an experiment. You just say, well, there's three different things. The chance of me picking one is one of three. Experimental probability means I actually ran an experiment with it, and this was my probability of picking the first one based off of the experiment, which isn't always one in three. It could be something different. So don't ever forget probability is a percentage. Probability of zero means 0% 0 chance of something occurring. Probability of one is a 100% chance of something occurring. So consider the following problem. Based on an experiment, we find there is a 33% chance a light bulb burns out too early. Again, this is experimental probability because it's an experiment. Your company purchased 2,000 light bulbs. How many are expected to burn out early? Well, 33%. This is using probability here. 33% chance a light bulb burns out too early. And you have 2,000 light bulbs. Typically, a percent is a percent of something. The word of, if you remember, means times, which means I would put 0.33 times 2,000 to find out how many of those light bulbs will probably burn out too early. And I get the answer of 660. There you go. So based off of my experiment, I know that 660 of these light bulbs will probably go bad, which means I should probably make a plan to adjust to that fact. But that is how you use your percentage. If you know the probability, you typically end up multiplying by whatever is there because percentages are typically percentages of something. You hardly ever have a percentage and add it or subtract it or divide it. It's usually going to be multiplication. Here's another experiment. At a school festival, a colored chip is randomly drawn out of a bag and replaced. The table below shows the results of 50 draws. Find the probability of choosing a blue chip. So again, based off of this, your probability of drawing a blue chip, total successful draws is nine because that's what's there. Total number of draws, which should be 50, but I'm just going to add them up to make sure 16 is 50. So again, success over total gives me 9 over 50, which again, if you're just depends on what they want. If they want a fraction, you'd use 9 over 50. If they want a percent, you do 9 divided by 50, which is 18% looks like. If they want the decimal, it's 0.18. It just depends on what they're asking for. Any of these three numbers is effective as your answer. Just make sure you reduce your fraction, but it depends on how they do it. So when you see that on homework, just read it, and it'll usually say, or it'll give you a percentage, or it'll give you a decimal answer, which has to be 0 0.18, or it gives you a fraction, and that's where you have to just adjust what it's doing. On your quiz, uh, I will be checking to make sure that those things are proper in terms of that if you put in the decimal but it's supposed to be a percent or whatever I'll give you the credit for that. You roll a 12-sided die. Find the probability that the number is greater than 8. If you have to, list all the numbers on a 12-sided die. Greater than 8 is what I want. Well, that's bigger than 8, that's bigger than 8, that's bigger than 8, and that's bigger than 8. So how many successes do I have? 
four because eight's not one of them. It says greater than eight, not equal to eight. How many numbers do I have to choose from? 12. So one of my answers, if I reduce that is one third. As a decimal, that's 0 0.33. As a percent, that's 33%. It would help if you just made sure you gave all three of those because you never know which one of those you actually need to do. So make sure you know how to convert your fraction into a decimal and make sure you know how to convert your decimal into a percent and you'll be safe either way. There's a lot of questions on this you're going to have to ask about, but again, you have to actually do the work because there's no way for me to teach you how to do this with every single question that's out there. Your company bills 1,300 cars. Of that 1,300, 21 were found to be defective. What is the probability a random car is defective? So we want defective. We built 1,300 cars, 21 were defective. So the probability of being defective, what well, we want defective, which means defective is a successful number. So 21 is my good number out of 1,300. We're probably gonna want the percentage on this. So 21 divided by 1,300 is, looks like, let's go with 0, .0 let's actually go to three digits. So 0 0.016. or 1.6% if you remember you moved the decimal two spots. So one of those two. Describe the complement. The complement is not typically like a complement. The actual complement in math is the opposite of what a complement would be in, in life, which is a good thing. The complement is the opposite. So if you think that you look nice, you would expect somebody to say you look nice, but a complement in math would be someone saying that you do not look nice. So the complement here would not be that it is defective, you would say is not defective. And so what's the probability that the complement occurs? Well, here's the thing. If complements are exact opposites and percentages add up to 100, you would simply take 100% minus 1.6%, which is 98.4%, or as you would say, point uh, 984. But again, check this out. If I take 0.16, I'm sorry, 0.016 plus 0 0.984. I didn't hit a point. 0 0.016 plus 0 0.984. Remember, I said probability of one is everything. And so when I take this probability plus that probability, it should add up to one because that covers everything. Or 1.6% plus 98.4% gives me 100%. However you view it, that's how the complement works. So if your company was, has to build 5,500 cars for an order, how many will be defective? So we go to our defective number, which is 1.6% or 0 0.016. And remember, we usually use this to multiply. So we would do 0 0.016 out of 5,500 gives me the number of cars that should be, be defective which tells me that 88 cars more than likely are going to be bad. So again, I will make a plan for 88 cars to be bad. So in this case, if I know I have to give out 5,500 cars for an order, as a business owner, this is where statistics comes in. As a business owner, I'm not going to run a, run 5,500 cars because I know 80 of, 88 of them are more than likely going to be defective. So I, on the other hand, might say let's do 5,600 because out of 5,600, if 88 are defective, I still have 5,500 to give to my customer because you do not want to give your customer faulty things. And again, that's where knowing your math and knowing how to figure that stuff out makes you important to a business owner because that makes them more money for having um, you know, integrity. And of course, the more money they make, if you're the reason they make it, they're typically willing to pay you. Once you learn that di dynamic of, of success and intelligence, then actually you figure out how to run the game to your favor. But anyway... Good luck on your work again. Send me questions that you have and I'll be glad to help you out. Just make sure you're not working too late. Good luck. Talk to you later.